Welcome to episode 197 of This Week in Linux, recorded live on May 7th, 2022. I'm your host, Michael Tunnell, and this is a Tux Digital podcast. If you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. On this week's episode, we've got some distro news, app news, and some gaming news. All of this and so much more coming up right now on your weekly source for Linux. Good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. Before we get started with the show this week, I just want to give you a quick reminder that we have some changes with the network from Destination Linux Network to now Tux Digital. That's why you heard me say it's a Tux Digital podcast. So check it out, tuxdigital.com. There's a lot of great stuff. We're basically migrating everything to tuxdigital.com. So all the podcasts and videos are going to be there. So if you haven't bookmarked it, be sure to do that. There's also a lot of cool stuff I've been working on to do some fancy stuff with tuxdigital.com. So if you haven't seen it recently, be sure to go check it out because I'm really happy about the different styles that the website modifies itself based on what podcast you're checking out at the time. I think I, I like that. It's pretty cool. Anyway, tuxdigital.com. Mozilla has announced the latest release of the Firefox web browser. And while it isn't a massive release packed with all sorts of features, it has reached an impressive milestone. This week we saw the release of Firefox 100. We also talked about Google Chrome 100 on episode 192, so if you'd like to info on that one, you can check out that episode. I'll have it linked in the show notes. Now, like I said, this release of Firefox is not a powerhouse of features, but it does come with some interesting features that are worth highlighting. For example, Firefox 100 introduces, by default, the GTK overlay scroll bars. This is a nice addition to the browser, as it, well, basically, it makes the scroll bars hidden when you aren't interacting with the page in a scrolling function. And when they, they are displayed, they're much smaller visually, well, if, unless you start interacting with it. So it just kind of shows that they're there, but once you start interacting, it increases the size, so you can click on them much easier. And I like this feature for, well, one particular reason. And it looks nice. That is cool. I like that. But I like it because the scroll bars will now no longer be taking up space in screenshots. I know that isn't really a big deal, but I take screenshots all the time for this show, so I appreciate that. And Firefox 100 also has added support for captions and subtitles in the picture-in-picture mode. The picture-in-picture mode is the pop-out player that is available when you're viewing video on services like YouTube, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and that sort of stuff. This was a community requested feature that I think is really nice to see added. I didn't think I would use the picture in picture mode much at all when they first introduced it, but ever since they added it, I've used it way more times than I can count. So I might be, I might be surprised that I might want the captions as well too. We'll see. Also new in Firefox 100 is the website appearance section in the system settings. Now, this lets you set your preferences for websites so you can choose to follow Firefox setting, the system settings of your distribution, or more specifically choose light or dark. Now I prefer dark mode in most situations, but there are times where I'm annoyed by some websites that force a dark mode, but didn't take the time to make their dark mode actually look good. So it's like, yay, it's dark and ugly. This is why Dark Reader is cool, because if I can choose to turn this into like the setting, turning it to light mode, I can then use Dark Reader to have it if I want it dark or not. And also, typically what happens is that they're not taking in consideration the dark mode, so even if it is dark, it doesn't look good, and then the Dark Reader process is better looking anyway, so there's that. So I like the fact that I now can choose to turn off the dark mode on websites that forcibly make me have a dark mode that isn't a good looking dark mode. Now, there might you know, be some issues for some people on Firefox 100 on some websites. This is something that users of Google Chrome or anything based on Chromium 100 will also face, and it's, it's kind of weird. So I just wanted to make sure you are aware it's a possibility. Some websites could have issues due to the three-digit version number, as some may be using code that looks for two-digit two version numbers, such as using uh, user agent parsing, for example. Uh, Google and Mozilla have been working on this for months, so it's likely that the majority of the web you'd be fine to use, but there is a possibility that it still could occur. For those alive during the Y2K issue back in 1999, well, it's kind of like that, except that websites look for a version number 
but they're not likely well made well in the first place because if you're a website doing this, you should be using web standards and therefore not have to care about what version or even what browser someone is using. But there you go. I just wanted to let you know that this is a possibility. And if you do run into a website that does have issues with version 100 of Firefox or the later versions, then you can submit it to Mozilla in a form that I will have linked in the show notes. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest version of Firefox 100, well, link in the show notes. Let's talk about bottles. Do you prefer glass bottles, plastic bottles, or maybe the kind of bottle that lets you run sandboxed applications and games in your Linux operating system? Let's talk about that one for this topic. Bottles is a very cool open source application to help you manage various programs and games on Linux with Wine. Some of the features that Bottles offer is a gaming environment that comes pre-configured to support a large set of Windows video games on Linux. It also introduces a new way to handle Windows prefixes using environments. It's a combination of being able to have ready-to-use settings, libraries, and dependencies. Bottles also has an installer, which makes it easier for you to install games or applications really quickly, just directly through Bottles. And there's many, many more features. Now, this latest version of 20. 22.5.2, based on the day it was released, of Bottles was released, and they attended the Linux App Summit and also delivered a presentation of the Bottles project. If you'd like to learn more about that, I'll have a link to the video in the show notes. This new version has the user interface reworked to better align with the guidelines of the GNOME Circle apps, and it it improves the first user experience by adding uh, guidance to the main steps of Bottles usage and removes kind of like a noise that could cause distraction and confusion and to make it easier for those people who are just getting started with bottles. There's the importer has been completely redesigned in this release and there are performance improvements as well as various bug fixes. The bottles project also recently became members of the GNOME foundation, which gives them various rights to participate in a wide variety of things, including voting on organizational stuff like the GNOME board of directors. So, Bottles is also working to become part of the GNOME's Circle initiative, which is essentially classifying some applications as not necessarily official apps, but rather kind of getting the seal of approval from GNOME and some other perks. If you'd like to learn more about this awesome project, which is called Bottles, then check the link in the show notes. The Tails project has released version 5.0 of the portable operating system that's goal is to protect users against surveillance and censorship. For those unfamiliar with Tails, Tails is an acronym for the Amnesic Incognito Live System. That's why they call it Tails. So Tails 5.0 is the latest major release and with it a lot of changes come. So for example, Tails 5.0 is the first version to be based on Debian 11, upgrading it from Debian 10. This also means that Tails will be using GNOME 3.38 as the desktop environment, as this is the most up-to-date version of GNOME in Debian stable. This bumps Tails from GNOME 3.30 to 3.38. For those curious, because it's not using GNOME 40, well, this is reason is because it's based on Debian, and a lot of packages in Debian are not going to be the freshest available. For those wanting to have GNOME 40 inside of Tails, well, you're probably going to be waiting a while. One big change to note is that Tails 5.0 is replacing the Open PGP applet and the password and keys utility with the KDE app Cleopatra. Cleopatra spelled with a K, naturally. The other big change is that persistent storage is now enabled by default. This is an interesting choice, as that kind of makes it no longer amnesic in a way, but there were many requests for it by the community. And if you'd like to learn more about Tails 5.0, then be sure to check out the next episode of Destination Linux, because we're going to be taking a deeper look at this distro. And of course, link in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Cloud computing can be, let's say, complex. But standing up reliable, affordable cloud infrastructure really doesn't have to be. At DigitalOcean, you you can enjoy a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Also, with DigitalOcean, you get predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love. That's DigitalOcean. Plus, you can get support at every stage of growth, whether you're a team of one person or a team of a thousand people. With simple, powerful computing, you can get started and growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener to This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the Tux Digital community, you can get started for free on DigitalOcean. 
In fact, it's even better than free because DigitalOcean give you a one hundred dollar free credit. That's right, one hundred dollar free credit on do.co slash tux twenty twenty two. So go to do.co slash tux twenty twenty two to get that awesome one hundred dollar free credit to try out the great tools and the really fantastic marketplace and the, the tutorials and all the great stuff at DigitalOcean. So again, go to do.co slash tux2022 to check it out. And we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Have you ever tried to use apt to install something on the command line only to find out that it's not in the repository and thought to yourself, drats, now I have to find where to get this. Well, I've got news for you. There is now a new tool coming out of Wimpy's world, the dev behind Ubuntu Mate and Rolling Rhino. How much would you pay for a solution such as this? $100? $100? This new project is available to you at the low, low rate of free. I wonder if anyone got the $1,000 reference. Let me know if you did in the comments. Okay, for real now, Martin WordPress has created a new tool called DebGit that lets you install .deb files from third-party repositories, uh, which includes PPAs, directly from websites like Google Chrome, also from GitHub, and more. Now, Martin describes the project as app-git functionality for DEBs published in third-party repositories or via direct download. It's important to note that this project is only confirmed to work with Ubuntu and derivatives of Ubuntu. So, there's that. Uh, DebGit is all is more than just installing apps, though. It can also handle updates, upgrades, removals, uh, purging, cleaning, and searching as well. Now, this is not intended to just install anything from these repositories, but rather it provides a curated list of apps that it supports, kind of like Ubuntu Mate's app for the so software boutique. Uh, I tend to prefer flat packs for a third-party solution myself, but there are some applications that simply aren't available as flat packs yet, so this might be something to check out for those who are using Ubuntu or an Ubuntu derivative. If you'd like for more information on DebGit and a list of the software that it supports, link in the show notes. Last week, we talked about the Ubuntu remix that ships with the Unity desktop environment, which is, of course, called Ubuntu Unity. This week, there was some really interesting news related to this project, and that is that they are breathing new life into Unity 7 with the first major release of the desktop in six years. Okay, so real quick, let's go over the history of Unity because it is quite possible that many of you, especially those of you who are new to the Linux ecosystem, might not know what the Unity desktop is and might not have even heard of it before. So all the way back in the year 2010, 2010, Canonical brought to us the first version of the Unity desktop. At the time, it was only available via the Ubuntu Netbook Edition, but later it became the default desktop environment for the main Ubuntu distro. Unity was beloved by some and hated by many. Personally, I was in the loved camp. Well, okay, I loved parts of it. They also did some annoying things that aren't that important right now to discuss, but there was a lot of stuff that I loved about it. Most notable things were the HUD, a.k.a. the heads-up display, which was in no way actually a HUD, and I have no idea why they called it that, but it was a very cool feature. And I might talk about that in a future video or something like that if you're interested. Uh, Ubuntu's Unity also had the functionality of a global menu and locally integrated menus, which were really cool as well. I especially liked how they saved so much screen real estate without losing functionality thanks to all these different features. But in 2017, Canonical announced it was canceling the Unity desktop, right at the point where people were starting to be more receptive to this desktop. The timing was unfortunate. But on the bright side, this was also the early stage of my YouTube channel. So it was a prime opportunity to, to make a video that would later go viral, which it did. For those interested, it's a video entitled Why Ubuntu Should Use KDE Plasma Instead of GNOME for Ubuntu 1804 and has 221,988 views at the moment. If you would like to help push it past the 222,000 mark, feel free to check the link in the show notes. Anyway, Canonical canceled the Unity desktop, and for years it has been sitting dormant, only receiving maintenance updates here and there, due to it being part of an Ubuntu LTS release, which is specifically the 1604 release and the five-year maintenance requirement for Ubuntu 16.04 ended last year, so at that point, I, like many others, expected this to be the death of the Unity desktop. Now, there have been some 
remixes and forks over the years. But this was interesting because the Ubuntu Unity Remix team has recently released a version of 7.6 of the Unity desktop, which brings many major changes in addition to reviving the once dead desktop or seemingly dead desktop. So let's talk about Unity 7.6. This version has the dash been changed and the HUD have also been redesigned. Uh, for those who don't know, the dash is like the main menu. When you click the icon, it pops up this thing. That's called the dash. Then HUD is a really cool way to interact with your applications through the main menu system. Okay, not the main menu system, but the app menu system. It's hard to describe it verbally. It's better for me to show it. If you check out that video I talked about in the uh, earlier in this topic, I'll have it linked in the show notes about like why they should use Plasma. I talk about the, fir- the different features of like the HUD and all sorts of stuff in more detail. So you can check that out in terms of seeing what they were and what they could do. Uh, and the HUD, these, these, the HUD and the dash have been redesigned for a modern flat look, which I think looks quite good. And they migrated the, com- the complete Unity 7 shell source code to GitLab and have got it to compile on 2204, which I was kind of not expecting that to work because of the different dependencies and all that stuff. So that's pretty cool. And I, and I also like that they retain the system-wide blur effect when switching to this modern flat look. So you get the combination of a modern style, but also with a nice flat appeal. So they've also done some performance improvements and some bug fixes and that sort of the stuff. Now, there are other projects that are working on something similar, like I mentioned. So there's a Unity X project, which is also from Ubuntu Unity Remix. And there's also a, this, oh, that, by the way, that one is based on XFCE, which is pretty interesting. Then there's also the UV Ports team that make the Linux mobile OS called Ubuntu Touch that have their Lomiri project, which is a fork of Unity 8. Now, this is a rather complicated topic, and I think the, ish, the history around it is really interesting. And I could go on and on and on and provide much more information if you like, but during this show, this show, it's probably too much to include in the topic. I mean, I was around for the entirety of the Unity saga, but instead of doing that right now, I'm thinking I might make a video about this. Would you be interested in a video on this topic from me on this channel? If so, let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to learn more about Unity 7.6 from the Ubuntu Unity team, then, or maybe even help with the testing, because this is a release for testing, check the link in the show notes. Let's go from one revived desktop environment to another and talk about the Trinity desktop. So the names are kind of similar, which is a little funny, but Trinity is not related to Unity in any way. Trinity is a desktop that was forked from KDE, and it was, in fact, forked from the KDE 3.5 era, which was the pre-Plasma era. They forked KDE 3.5 back in 2010 as a way to continue, continue development of that branch of KDE due to disagreements with KDE's direction for KDE Plasma that started with Plasma 4 in 2008. Trinity Desktop Environment is now a fully independent project with its own personality to go with it. They even have their own fork of Qt for the Qt 3.0 or 3.x series. So that is something, if you might want to check out the older versions of KDE, that's a way to kind of relive that if you want to. Uh, This week we saw the release of Trinity Desktop version R14.0.12. It's a long number. Uh, This isn't a major release, but it kind of, I kind of wanted to give it some time on the show as I don't think I've covered it on Twill before. And the timing of this release with the reviving of Unity 7, it just kind of made sense, I felt, to put it on the show. This release comes with new Dbus-based Polkit authentication agent, new Markdown document viewer, support for Let's Encrypt certificates, various bug fixes, and other improvements. It also adds support for being used on Ubuntu 2204 Jammy Jellyfish. And if you'd like to learn more about Trinity Desktop, I'll have a link in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash tux. Bitwarden is a password manager that has, basically, it allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do it? Well, it provides you with various amounts of tools, such as the Password Vault, which you can store all of your passwords in. Also, you can auto-generate passwords for you and even automatically fill in passwords on login forms so you don't have to do it. And also, a new feature of the auto-generator is that in addition to passwords, you can also now auto-generate usernames, which is pretty cool. You can access your data across many different types of devices with your web browser, your mobile applications, desktop application, or even on the command line. Plus, 
Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your devices, so you know you're the only person with access to your data. And for a password manager, that's pretty important. So go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started. And did I mention you can start it for free? Well, you can, but I think you want to check out the premium account as well because for less than a dollar per month, that's right, less than a dollar per month will get you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. You get all of this for less than a dollar per month. So make the smart move like many of your community have and go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started with your account. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. If you want your media inside of a vault that is always open, well, actually, phrasing it that way seems pretty weird. An always open vault sounds rather ineffective, but... Okay, I'm talking about the network attached storage or NAS solution based on Debian Linux called Open Media Vault. So that's why. It contains services like SSH, SFTP, SMB, SIFS, DAAP Media Server, RSync, BitTorrent Clients, and many more. And also thanks to this modular design of it and of the framework, it can be enhanced via plugins. So this week we have the latest release of Open Media Vault 6.0 to talk about, and with it they have upgraded to be based on Debian 11 Bullseye. They have also introduced a new user interface that they've written from scratch. They added some new plugins that are based on containers such as S3, Own Tone, that's fun to say, Photo Prism, Wii TTY, OneDrive, and more. They also have improved the ISO installer and many other enhancements as well. And if you're already using Open Media Vault, then I suggest checking out the release notes as there are some things that you will want to know before upgrading and I'll have that link in the show notes. The GCC developers are proud to announce another major version of the GCC project, and that is 12.1. This year, the GCC team, and all of us really, are celebrating the 35th anniversary of the project. The GCC project has made it possible to compile stuff for the Linux ecosystem well before Linux even existed. So it's an important project. And this release introduces support for the CTF debugging format, the C and C++ front ends continue to advance with extending support for features in the upcoming C2X and C++23. Also, this, and also the C++ standard library improves support for the experimental C++20 and C++23 parts. The Fortran front end now fully supports TS291113 for interoperability with C, and GCC now understands Clang's uh, extension for built-in shuffle vector, making it easier to change generic vector code. Starting with GCC 12, vectorization is enabled at the 0-2 zero, zero optimization level using the very cheap cost model, which puts extra constraints on code size expansion. Now, if any of that stuff makes sense to you, then you might want to check out some of the more detailed release notes in the show notes. Now, personally, I didn't really understand what I was saying. But that's what it's giving for me for the details of this particular release notes. So if you understand what I was saying, then link in the show notes. <laughs> the next topic is an interesting one because I never cover politics or religion on this show. My passions are Linux and open source and comic books and movies and sci-fi as a genre. Okay, there's a lot of things that I'm passionate about apparently, but this show is about Linux and open source. So you're probably wondering... Why are you bringing up religion in your show? You see, there is a distro that's well. It's it's a new it's a new sort of. It's not exactly new, but more like revived distro that merges Linux and religion. After almost ten years of dormancy, Ubuntu CE, aka Ubuntu Christian Edition, has risen to begin releasing new versions once again. So Ubuntu CE has released a new version based on Ubuntu twenty two oh four LTS. So it includes all of the great stuff from Ubuntu 22.04 and GNOME 42. If you'd like to learn more about what is new with those, check out episode 195 for more information on Ubuntu 22.04 and episode 191 for more information on release of GNOME 42. Now back to the topic at hand. So Ubuntu CE might be worth checking out for some people in the audience. For example, it might be worth checking out for those with kids that want to deploy a content filtering system for them because Ubuntu CE is based directly from the standard Ubuntu distribution, and it contains extra Christian software, as of course you'd expect it to do. 
but it also has pre-configured with web content filtering through the clean browsing content filtering system. They say that clean browsing is an industry leading DNS provider that offers fast, secure DNS with state of the art content filtering. But if you want to check out something else, because you, you might not want to use the clean browsing, you can also switch around using the DNS minder tool that comes in Ubuntu CE that allows you to easily switch between other filtering methods like open DNS family shield 1.1.1 for families from Cloudflare that just rolls right off the tongue and also add guard family DNS are options inside of the DNS minder tool. They also have a host minder tool which is another application in Ubuntu CE for filtering, but in this way, it provides an easy way to block unwanted websites from your system. Ubuntu CE has included Bible study software for individuals and could also be a great choice for churches as it includes tools for them as well, such as sermon and presentation tools. If you'd like to learn more about Ubuntu CE and the history of it, I'll have links in the show notes. The team at Valve have been working hard to get Steam Decks out to everyone who's ordered one. And while I'm still waiting on my Steam Deck, no, I'm not bitter. Valve, I'm not. There's been a lot of people interested in trying out SteamOS 3.0, the immutable SteamOS based on Arch Linux and also using KDE Plasma. I am curious about using it myself. We're talking about interns of like using it on the desktop and other things. But unfortunately, this is not yet available directly from Valve. But interestingly enough, there is now an unofficial version of it called Holo ISO. This is the first beta release of Holo ISO. They also say that it is an almost full SteamOS 3.0. They say it works with the first boot experience for the Steam Deck, the main deck UI, the KDE Plasma desktop mode, including Valve's Vapor theme, global FSR support, frame limiting, and much more. Though it seems like it's only functioning properly with AMD users at the moment. So if you use Intel or NVIDIA, you're not going to have a great time with this. Uh, I personally will be waiting for SteamOS to be officially released to use it on my computers. But as with the Steam Deck itself, that's probably going to be a long wait. If you'd like to check out the Holo ISO instead and test it, test it for yourself and learn more about it in general, well, links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel and the show, we have multiple ways to contribute via Patreon, sponsors, and others. You can become a patron by going to tuxdigital.com contribute. And if you do become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium to discuss stuff between topics or to just hang out every week after the show. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at the store. You can go to right now, dealinstore.com. We're going to be changing that up in a bit because of the change to Tux Digital, but you can also go to tuxdigital.com to get a link to it as well because everything is at tuxdigital.com. So you can get hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more by going to dealinstore.com right now and then eventually tuxdigital.com. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episodes of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of both of those shows on the Tux Digital Network. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, or 1700 UTC, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each and every week by going to TuxDigital.com. So I'm going to say that multiple times, apparently. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Tux Digital Network. And this has been a Tux Digital Podcast, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux. Good news.